Hello, I'm Gabby. Welcome to another episode of the Happier Life Project, brought to you by the free award-winning mental health and wellness app, My Possible Self. Last year, the World Health Organization declared that loneliness is a pressing global health threat. Research has shown that severe loneliness poses the same health risk as smoking 15 cigarettes a day and can decrease your life expectancy by 25 to 30 percent. We all know what loneliness feels like and feeling lonely from time to time is a normal part of life. But when loneliness is severe and or persists over an extended period of time, it can have a detrimental impact on both our physical and mental well-being. Recent studies have highlighted the stark connections between chronic loneliness and various mental health illnesses, including depression, anxiety, and cognitive decline. The pandemic really illuminated how important human connection, relationships, and physical interaction really is. And although digitally we may be more connected than ever, for those who suffer with loneliness, this only amplifies the void of human interaction if you find yourself isolated, remote, and lacking in community. Addressing loneliness is crucial, not only for enhancing individual quality of life, but also for fostering healthier, more resilient communities. And today's guest, Dr. Richard Pyle, a GP specializing in lifestyle medicine and cardiology, an author, TEDx speaker, blogger, podcaster, mentor, and coach, is working tirelessly to enforce this message. I discovered Dr. Richard through his TEDx talk, The Dangers of Loneliness, which I highly recommend you watching. I'll put the link in this episode's show notes. And it's also worth checking out his book, Fit for Purpose, your guide to health, well-being, and living a meaningful life, which also drives home the importance of connection. In today's episode, you're going to hear some shocking facts about the impact of severe loneliness, demonstrating exactly why we shouldn't ignore. You're also going to learn about some of the causes of loneliness, how technology is both a help and a hindrance, and how by reaching out to others who we suspect might be struggling, we're not just helping them, but we're helping ourselves along the way. Plus, Dr. Richard shares some suggestions on what we can do to nurture the relationships we have, instigate new connections, and find our tribes to bring more meaning and purpose to our life. So, ready to find a healthier, happier you? Let's get started. Welcome, Dr. Richard Powell, to the Happier Life Project podcast. I'm delighted I finally found somebody to talk about this very huge and important subject that's um, done the research as well, which, of course, is loneliness. Mm. But before we dig in, I am absolutely fascinated with your background, being a very busy, I'm sure, GP, but then advocating and also writing a book on the whole lifestyle medicine side of what you are clearly very passionate about, I think makes you quite unique for um, somebody that is an NHS doctor that I'm sure is just like working around the clock as it is. So I'd love to know what makes you so passionate about lifestyle medicine, because I think this all weaves into what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, thanks, Gabby. I mean, I, I have to say, I, based on my knowledge of some of my colleagues, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm unique, but I think it's my personal experience that led me down the route of lifestyle medicine. And I think that's true of a lot of things in life. People often have something happen in their life that means that they develop that that area of interest. Mm. Uh, and like a lot of other doctors, Gabby, I, I trained, gosh, how long ago did I qualify? 24 years ago as a GP. Mm. And, and when I qualified, I was very much the kind of 
what does a doctor do? Well, a doctor listens to a patient sometimes. Uh, they uh, they get a collection of symptoms and signs. They make a diagnosis and then they, they do some doctory stuff. So they give them some pills. They refer them for tests. Maybe they do a bit of surgery. That's how medicine works. But I think through my own circumstances, I realised that there was a lot more to it than that. Um, and, and really the trigger for me was not just the fact that often when I was sitting in a consultation with patients, I found myself thinking, I really can't help you with what's the root cause of your problem because it's your life. And yet you're ending up sitting in front of me as a medical expert. Mm. But it was our own life. So so my son, Luke, who's 27 and a, and a wonderful human being, has severe complex epilepsy and life was very challenging for us because we were on call 24 7 mm. um, like every day could be an emergency calling ambulances ending up in hospital um, and that took a toll on us physically and mentally as a family and it made me start to think you know what can I do to stop the wheels falling off how can I look after myself how can I look after my family mm. and once I started to explore that and looking at what we'd now call lifestyle medicine, it wasn't really called lifestyle medicine then, um, looking at things like my sleep, which wasn't very good, and my eating, which was okay, my drinking, probably a little bit too much alcohol than was good for me, my movement, my relationships, my, how I manage stress. It was only by looking into that that I realised what a difference that could make to me. And then if you're a hopefully a proper doctor, when you've learned all that stuff for yourself, what you don't do is go, well, that's good enough for me, but I'm not going to share it with anybody else. Okay. It's a special secret that I will keep to myself. So then you have no choice, but it leaks over into the rest of your life, however difficult that actually might make your life. Yeah. And then the rest really from there, doing a diploma, writing a book, et cetera, et cetera, that all just kind of followed. Well, I'm glad there's more than one of you out there. Um, yeah. Maybe it's just from my Definitely. own experience. <laughs> Good. From my own experience with my doctor's surgery, where I'm from, I've not met one like you, put it that way, because I've right. had various challenges, mental health ones, or gone for things like headaches, where I was just prescribed a painkiller or an antidepressant and uh, sent yeah. on my way. And it was a lot to do with time as well, because they're just so overwhelmed at my practice and I'm sure most practices yeah. around the country you know but like you said yourself the benefits can be so profound and so this is kind of why we have the my possible self app which is mm. um very much like yourself advocating for yes sometimes it's important to be on prescription medication for your mental health but then also holistically there is so much that you can do and so when it comes to mental health and today's topic, which is loneliness, I mean, I doubt anybody's walked through your doors and said, when you say, what, what can I help you with today? They say, doctor, I've got acute loneliness. Or am I wrong? Gabby, you're not wrong. Um, what tends to happen is that they present with something else, what we might call the presenting complaint. What kind of stuff that, would that And that so? could be... You know, headaches, low moods, mm. uh, symptoms of anxiety, other physical symptoms could be, you know, palpitations, chest pain, irritable really? bowel syndrome. Yeah, all, all manner of, of things. Yeah. Wow. I thought maybe like fatigue, like we said, low mood, and maybe yeah. like muscle aches or something, yeah. I could imagine. But uh, palpitations, because of feeling isolated and alone. Absolutely, because when we're when we're feeling lonely, mm. and we can talk more a bit about you know how you define loneliness, but w when you feel lonely, essentially you are fearful. You're in fight or flight mode uh, in your body. So you've got you know yeah. your heart's racing, you've got adrenaline and cortisol surging around your system. But of course, instead of just being in fight or flight because you're running away from a lion that's trying to chase you or you're trying to jump onto a bus, mm. you're chronically lonely. So you're chronically stressed, chronically anxious. That causes inflammation. So you can actually measure levels of inflammation within your body, for example, with blood tests that show people when they're struggling with their mental health, including loneliness, that they are inflamed. And then it's that inflammation which causes many, many of the common symptoms. So People don't always appreciate that link between the physical yeah. and the mental. 
but they are completely joined. And the idea that you can somehow say these symptoms occur above the neck and these symptoms occur below it and never the two shall meet mm. is something that we've all been guilty of, doctors and patients over the years, but increasingly it's understood that's not the case. So everything is connected. That's just blowing my mind because, I mean, I've jumped ahead a little bit because I was going to get into the physical symptoms of loneliness, but like, yeah, I think some people might be really struggling with feeling alone, but then also be struggling with some of those physical symptoms and not put the two together and then therefore mm -hmm. think there's something wrong with me. Like if I'm going to have a heart attack or it, it could almost veer off into creating more mental health problems and physical problems because you're not putting the two and two together and being like, oh, it's because of this, right? How do I address this, right? Because I think a lot of people accept loneliness as that's just their life now. Um, do you think that? I think I would agree with both things you said. So first of all, you commented on something about people presenting with physical symptoms and not realizing it's linked. Yeah. I can think of one patient at our practice. Obviously, I'm not going to you know, breach their confidentiality, but they they present to us hundreds of times a year that's not an exaggeration hundreds of times a year in phone calls or face-to-face -face appointments and essentially it's because they're lonely that's what it basically boils down to they've got some other health issues but it's primarily loneliness and if a person can understand that you can start to have a really good conversation what's extra tricky is when someone doesn't get that and, and the best thing you can hope for is that you start the conversation so maybe they begin to understand it mm -hmm. and then and then you might lead on to a slightly richer conversation. Uh, it's difficult when the person in question says, and I recommend the use of a social prescriber. We can always talk about what they are. Yeah. Um, they look at me suspiciously and say, are you telling me that I'm wasting your time, <laughs> Dr. Pyle? And I'm thinking, I'm not going to nod my head. So, yes, people may not be aware of it. But then, yes, the, the loneliness can, I guess, make everything worse as well. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to backpedal a little bit because I did want to kind of define loneliness. And I pulled this from yeah. the dictionary definition. The dictionary definition of loneliness is the unhappiness that is felt by somebody because they do not have any friends or do not have anyone to talk to. Mm. And that's the dictionary definition. How would you maybe elaborate on that? And I don't see there's anything wrong with that. Uh, the, the slightly different words I would use, which I used in my in my TEDx talk, are that loneliness is a mismatch between the quality and the quantity of relationships that you mm. have and those that you need. Because obviously we all need different amounts. So there's nothing wrong with being alone because we all need some alone time. And there's nothing wrong with being lonely in the same sense that there's nothing wrong with being bored in life. There's nothing wrong with having to wait for things. There's nothing wrong with having to sometimes struggle through difficulties in life because that is life and we should learn from it and we can't avoid it. But it's when that mismatch is chronic, when it's there all the time or a lot of the time, that's what triggers the the fearful response, which triggers the inflammation, which triggers those long-term conditions that, we've, that I've referred to. That That's essentially what loneliness is. Yeah. Wow. Um, and just going a little bit more into the mental health aspect, this was taken from psychiatry.org. Persistent loneliness is associated with higher rates of heart disease, obesity, depression, anxiety, and dementia. While it impacts people of all ages and backgrounds, some people are more at risk than others. Mm. I feel like as well, it's probably a bit of a vicious cycle because like, if you are struggling with your mental health, you probably don't want to socialize. You might have connections, but you feel like too anxious to do so or too low. But then that is, could actually be helping you alleviate some of those symptoms if you could push mm. through them, but you probably don't feel like you can. Mm. Yeah. So then if you're isolated because you just are because of life, I think then that could actually bring on some of these mental health problems like depression and anxiety. So it does seem to be like this challenging cycle that needs to break. Yes, I agree. I think that's true. I mean, you started off by saying that you, you mentioned that you quoted the association between loneliness and, and ill health. Mm. Um, it's thought that it is at least as bad for you as obesity, as physical inactivity, as smoking. You know, we compare everything to smoking, don't we? Obesity is the new <laughs> yeah. smoking. Physical inactivity is the new smoking. Well, guess what? Loneliness is also the new, new smoking. smoking. 
and it could increase your risk of dying early from any cause by about 30 percent which is huge 30 percent 30 percent and into what that might mean in real life is in some people it could knock off you know five ten fifteen twenty years of their life potentially that's been shown in some studies because of that inflammatory effect of of loneliness so it's it's not to be underestimated it's no. a really really big deal yeah yeah we absolutely shouldn't be burying our head in the sand in your tedx talk loneliness may be worse for you than cancer seemed to be like a, a tagline that i mm. came across on google mm. of, you know when your video came up so what is it the stats you had done some research it was like one in two yeah so i did a lot of research for the tedx talk because i don't know how much you know about about tedx but you can only say things in a TEDx talk which you can reference. You have to be able to back them up. You're not allowed to spout nonsense for 12 minutes or however long it is. So I already had a bit of an idea, but then I went away and did a bit more research in the prep. One of the stats that I quote in the talk are roughly from memory that your chance of being affected by cancer in your lifetime is about one in two. And, and interestingly, that used to be one in four or one in five a few decades ago. So something's going on there. That may be outside the remit of today's conversation, but that, yeah. that's relevant to all of this. Um, and actually, your lifetime chance of being significantly affected by loneliness is the same. So, so the chance of being affected are the same. Mm. But potentially, the real problem is that the outcomes may be worse. And now, now, please don't get me wrong, you know, in case anyone's listening to this who's you know, suffering from a life limiting illness as a result of cancer or has a bad prognosis, you know, they might be thinking, well, I'd, I'd take loneliness over my lung cancer any day. Mm -hmm. But we're talking on average. Mm -hmm. And the reasons I gave in the talk and in my research were because, first of all, we're not very good at picking it up. So you, you can be lonely for quite a long time and be developing all those health problems before it becomes diagnosed. And that's can mm. be true of cancer, but it isn't for all of them because we have national screening programs for breast cancer, for bowel cancer, for ovarian cancer, but we don't have a national screening program for loneliness. No, you did refer in your TEDx talk to, is it the loneliness scale? Yeah. There was a couple, but one of them seemed to be very, it wasn't an easy like tick A, B or C. I had to like, you do the sums and then you add it up and then the results were here, there and everywhere. I think that might have been mm the loneliness scale and then wasn't yeah it wasn't something like you said a template to to a check through and do you know what I'm trying to say I'm not saying it very well <laughs> no I think I think I get what you're saying it, it the problem is with with those tools that they're not terribly user-friendly yeah uh, they can take a while to do people wouldn't necessarily know they're out there and some of them you have to pay to use anyway like the UCLA thing and the the alone scale but actually I did look at a study which said they compared the complicated questions to the mini less complicated questions to the one question and it turned out that it was pretty much as as good at predicting significant loneliness and that question was you'll be unsurprised to guess do you often feel lonely yeah and that, and that's true in the sense that we know as doctors that are actually asking your patient do you often feel depressed you know will often get you the the answer to depression or you know the diagnosis mm. so so we don't have a screening program, but we could have, and we you know we could get into that. The, the other problems, I think, in comparison with cancer is that we spend an awful lot of time and money on cancer treatment, don't we? I mean, every day in the newspaper, great news, here's a new yep. gene therapy for cancer. Here's something that doesn't just treat particular cancers, but zaps your immune system at just the right point and affects your mitochondria and stops all these cancers developing. And cancer is a condition that we can live with and it will be a long term problem and you'll survive it for decades, not months or years. But we're not putting the effort in when it comes to loneliness. And, and some cancers have got a 90 to 100 percent five year survival rate. If you're alive at five years after most cancer diagnoses, you are considered cured. But loneliness doesn't. And the other point that I made was that it's the groups that are affected as well. This is kind of the toughest thing, Gabby, I think, because you might expect that the loneliest group would maybe be an older patients, be yeah. sicker patients, be frailer patients, be bereaved patients. But actually the most lonely group in society are the 16 to 24 year olds. Mm. Um, and they're the people with their whole lives still in front of them. Mm. But in some respects are lonelier and more challenged than people 60 years older than them dealing with ill health, dealing with bereavement. Uh, and what concerns me about that is that if that's true now, 
what are they going to be like when they're 30 and 40 and 50 and 60? And are they, will they become less lonely? Because some of the things that make you lonely when you're a teenager are natural. And to some extent, it's always been the case. Or will they become more unwell because they've been lonelier for longer in younger life and therefore they develop all these long-term conditions and the inflammation I've talked about so that's that's why loneliness I believe can be worse for you than than cancer yeah well and I would wager at least 50 percent of our listeners will be in that age demographic that you just referenced so we are going to get into some what can we do to help manage this or to alleviate it I suppose but I, I couldn't help but think about my grandparents when you were talking and how different the world was pre-COVID days, that's for sure. But going back to like their generation, I remember when I was out with them as a little kid, they'd stop and talk to everybody in the street, on the bus, in cafes, at church. It was like everybody was somebody they knew, even if they weren't. And as the years have gone by, We've lost that. So now it would seem very bizarre if somebody was just chatting to everybody that came across their path now. And it would seem more bizarre than normal, yeah. which I think is a really big shame. What do you think about that? No, I agree. And um, uh, w- w- which part of the world do you come from? <laughs> I'm a northern lass. I'm from Lancashire. Lytham. Right. Okay. Well, I'm I'm from Stockport originally. In, oh, in okay. Yeah, I went to Uni um, Manchester. So, and, and uh, yeah, great place. Obviously, he says not that I'm biased. But um, uh, the reason I ask you that question is because it made me think. You said you wouldn't do that nowadays, or you you might be a bit odd if you did. And I remember these humorous news headlines where you can where we say cheerful Northerner freaks Londoners out by talking to them on the tube. <laughs> and yeah, and it's that I don't I don't like being one of these. You know, it's all going to hell in a handcart people and. Oh, I remember when all this were fields or whatever. But mm-hmm. I, I do think that um, we have seen that shift in our society. I think we are more inward looking. Mm. I think if we're not careful, if we absorb through social media and the news, a lot of the bad news that's filtered towards us, we probably begin to think the world's a bit of a bad place. So we're probably less trusting. Mm-hmm. We might be you know, more concerned about reaching out to other people or having conversations with people that we don't know. And we're living lives which you don't need to physically connect with people to get stuff done, do you? To get That's your true. shopping, to so get your work done, to socialise yeah. to some extent. Now, yeah. I believe you do need that because I think our brains are not fooled by that and they absolutely know the difference. But you can choose to conduct your relationships like that. And I think that is absolutely to our detriment. Mm, yeah even the simplest thing of like asking the time or for directions mm. you know we don't need to do that now because we just look at our phone but um yeah yeah i've got to quickly touch upon the pandemic because i do think that this is like heightened because of the way the world changed and pivoted so so many more people could work remotely which certainly has its pros as well as the cons but I think you'll agree that the biggest con is this isolation now. If you, especially if you you don't have a family, if you live alone and you work from your screen at home, then that can be it can be really challenging. And again, I think it goes back to this cycle of like you can almost feel very apprehensive then to make yourself go out and and connect with people because you've been so isolated. Yeah. And there are so many examples of that that spring to mind. So if I just cast my mind back to kind of working my way through what happened in the pandemic, first of all, and I say this with hindsight, because I don't blame the government, particularly at the time, for being very cautious. But with hindsight, it was a massive mistake to tell people that they you know, could only go outside for, what was it, an hour a day? And you weren't allowed to do that with anybody else. And yeah. people at, sitting at the opposite end of park benches getting interviewed by the police. I mean, that... Yeah. that demonstrated a fundamental lack of understanding about how humans work. Mm. Um, And then we had schools going online. Mm. Uh, And what we shouldn't forget at all is that, you know, let's, let's, you're obviously younger than me, but I'm, I'm 51. So only a couple of years of my life were affected by lockdowns, maybe 18 months thereabouts, which is a small proportion of my life. And there was my, I was able to remind myself that there is more to life than this. And this isn't how the world works all the time. But if you're a young kid in primary school, or maybe just starting in secondary school, and for a year or two, your relationships had to be virtual. You were, if you were lucky enough to have all the right tech and supportive parents, you were 
talking to people online. You weren't allowed to mix. You weren't allowed to socialize. That's a massive chunk of your life. And in that time, your brain gets rewired because you, you learn to interact with people remotely and digitally, which both creates a problem in itself, because as I've said, our brains are not fooled by that. It's better than nothing, but they're not fooled by it. Mm. And then the other point you made was when you come to interact again, it can be difficult and lots of people will manage that, but it, it, it can be daunting. And I remember being struck by my two kids who were living at home. I've got four kids, but only two were at home during the pandemic. And they actually quite liked lockdown. They, it wasn't brilliantly great all the time, but um, the, the school did very well. We were close to family. We had a nice house to live in. The broadband work, they had computers. It was OK. Mm. But when they went back to school, although on one level, they were really looking forward to it. And yeah. they did. Once they were back in, they loved it. But I remember they did admit to me that they were feeling a bit anxious as well about going back into the classroom and sitting in the same room as 30 other people. Yeah. And for some people, of course, that's their whole life. S sometimes when if you're someone who's really anxious, really lonely, really depressed, people did make comments on social media during the pandemic when people were describing how awful it was being isolated, living by themselves. They just said, welcome to my world. This is business as usual for me. This is what I'm used to. Uh, and yet suddenly, because of this massive, it was like the world's biggest scientific experiment, but there was no ethical <laughs> approval sort, was there? What we're going to do is yeah. we're going to take the whole world, and yeah. it's a lot of it, and we're going to put people into lockdown and we're going to see what happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We won't know. No, there's no ethical approval for this. We'll just crack on and we'll do it. Yeah. And we know what happened. And COVID was the initial COVID uh, infection. The, the, the pandemic was like an, an explosion, like a volcano going off under the water at sea. And the initial concern was about the immediate consequences of COVID, illness, death, etc. We were all terrified, weren't we? Mm. But then the second wave and the third wave and the tsunami that came in was all the consequence of that, the pandemic, which mm. was still seeing these tidal waves of loneliness, inflammation, explosions in long term conditions. And we're still experiencing that to this day. Yeah, I think I still am feeling the ramifications, to be honest with you, because my work changed because I worked for many years in audio, in radio and podcast, but it's always been in a studio. And mm. then, I mean, I was really lucky. I was working for Apple Music at the time when the pandemic started. So I was very well looked after and they had the money so that we could, you know, recreate radio studios and send equipment to whoever, whoever needed it to continue working and then you know in, in my field a, a lot of other places did the same so yeah now for me I can I can record a podcast from anywhere I'm in Lisbon right now talking to you which is like lovely and stuff but then like I've certainly noticed if I'm put in a group of people that I don't know I try and gravitate towards one person to talk to and I'm a bit intimidated where I think Probably before the pandemic, I wouldn't have been so bothered because, I mean, mm. I'm a presenter for a living, but I've, I've noticed it myself that I'm just, when I go into socialize with groups and if it's like more than a few people, then I'm just a bit like, I don't know how to interact. It's like I've forgotten how to communicate effectively, you know? Mm. It happens to everyone. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we can do what would you prescribe to somebody who is feeling lonely? And I guess I'm going to make it more hard for you and say lonely and shy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that is worth just dwelling on that for a moment, isn't it? And thinking about distinctions and definitions. So it's okay to be alone, as we've discussed. It's okay to be occasionally lonely. There is nothing wrong with being shy. Shy people aren't necessarily lonely people. You know, if you are an introvert, that, crudely speaking means that you get a lot of your stimulation from within and you don't need and you don't want as much from other people if you're an extrovert a bit more like me then, then you probably do need other people more but even a shy person talking about relationships and connections saying they don't need people is like someone who's got a small appetite saying that they don't need food you know we we do all need food right, right. We just need the right dose of people I think for me, one of the first things about loneliness, and again, this is going back to the to the TEDx talk, it's like uh, the, the parallel is with health problems. In an ideal world, of course, we prevent them rather than waiting for them to happen mm. and then having to deal with a fallout. And how might we prevent it? Well, going back to this conversation about the screening for loneliness, um, and this is where I think well-being is is a collective thing. We are interdependent on each other and we can't 
you can talk about your own well-being, but that's quite a selfish and narrow view of the world and probably not as fulfilling as you might imagine. But when we think about other people and our interdependence, we can enjoy greater well-being. So this is where you can think about other people. And what I've recommended is that people, you know, look for those who are feeling lonely. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, that might be people who are angry, people who are withdrawn, because even when you're lonely, you aren't necessarily reaching out to others going, can I be friends with you? You might just close in on yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so looking for anger, looking for changes in behaviour. If you're a friend or a family member or a colleague, you might recognise that they are struggling and that something's different and you could at least explore that. People might be using substances more, you know, drugs, alcohol. They might be spending a lot more time on the internet, social media, etc., chat rooms, whatever. And so looking for those signs of, of, of loneliness and then having a chat with them, which is more than just, you know what we do when we say talk to people and we go, hiya, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, you? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, thanks very much. And and you've you've had that social exchange of niceties that's the, like the, the box ticked for the day. Yeah. But just having your ears open a little bit more so that when, so, you know, when people look at you and they go, yeah, I'm all right. You know, what does that say? That doesn't mean I'm great. It means I've got stuff going on. I'm not sure that I want to talk to you about it now. I'm also not sure that you're really interested in listening to it. Mm. Mm-hmm. And you can just pick up on that and whether you've got the time in that moment, because actually you really were exchanging a nice tea and you're running to a meeting in 60 seconds, but you could still say, can we catch up later over a, a coffee or, you know, can we have a chance for a longer chat tomorrow or, you know, go out for a drink or whatever. Um, and sometimes you have got that in the moment, just listening to someone for five minutes talking about their, their life can actually, you shouldn't underestimate the, the difference that can make. So I think that screening approach involving and as i said as i say in the talk looking for people who are lonely listening to what they've got to say Mm -hmm. and lending a hand if you can i think that's part of it Mm -hmm. you know you you might be the solution you could be the colleague or the family member or the partner that can really help them but you might just be the person that starts the conversation and then helps them to think about where else they're going to go to get that support the advice that they need depending on the the problem and what's isolating them so Mm -hmm. there's that looking for people in terms of what you can do for yourself, I just think it's really important to remember that going back to the comment about the the food and the not needing it, um, we do all need connections ultimately. We have evolved in tribes. People who are not in a tribe don't survive. That's how it works. Now, it doesn't need to be a big tribe. It could be a really little tribe. Mm-hmm. but And we all need different doses of different people in different doses. But you do need to be in a tribe, as the quote says you know no man no person is an island and so even if it's just thinking about one or two relationships that can be the the starting point you know they could be relationships you already have that you are grateful for or that maybe you need to work on or restore Mm -hmm. um they could be reaching out to someone i don't know how you feel about this but it can feel quite awkward reaching out to people yeah, I can feel a bit. Well, when if it's in person, but when it's behind a device, it's not as bad, I think. But like, right. it's, I've I've actually just prescribed myself working from a co work, which I've okay. been doing for for a couple of weeks. It's like a ten minute walk from where I live because yeah. I was thinking this is getting ridiculous. Like sometimes all I see is like a person on a screen all day if I don't go shopping or whatever. And, you know, you can do that online, right? As we already talked about. So I was like, okay, I need to improve my level of actual human connection. So I, so I go to a co-work and there's been a couple of times where I'm like thinking about chatting more to somebody, you know, like getting a coffee or whatever. But again, it's just that awkwardness, which I never had before the pandemic. I think it's like uh, the fear of rejection almost and just over a simple five minute conversation. Like they're going to think I'm weird. I totally get that. And one of one of the GP that I was appraising the other day, um, I do this job where I sort of have a yearly chat with people to check on sort of how they're doing in terms of their education and their well-being. Mm -hmm. She'd come to the same conclusion. Some of her roles were remote and she decided that she was going to work with someone several days a week because it just made it so much better. And and I do get what you mean by the awkwardness, and I'm aware of that. But I think if we flip it round, if someone came up to you and said, do you want to grab a coffee? You know? Yeah. Do you want want to go for dinner? How are you doing? Do you want to, you know, are you free for a chat? Do you want to go for a walk? Most of the time, depending on the mood you're in, you probably wouldn't look at them and think, weirdo. 
and you might actually be quite flattered because that suggests that yeah they see something in you that they like yeah or at the very least that they look at you as someone who could potentially be able to support and help them and we know that supporting and helping other people actually is good for our own mental well-being so mm -hmm. it can seem awkward and i'm not suggesting that you walk up to people and just like you don't walk up to people and look them in the eye and go do you often feel lonely you know you don't necessarily walk up to people and go do you want to be my friend <laughs> ease into yeah. the conversation yeah, uh, you know, yeah chat about whatever it is that's natural for you the work you're doing the weather england's debatable performance in the euros or whatever you know start with that yeah um, and, and just let humans be humans you know these conversations tend to evolve you'll get a feeling for whether this is someone that you're going to connect with mm. it might seem daunting but actually it's really not that bad and as you say it, it's easier to do it through a device but i would argue it's much more meaningful to do it face to face because you, you know you must get invites from people on linkedin all the time i don't know how many linkedin followers i've got it's 500 a thousand whatever yeah um, are those for relationships no of course they're not yeah absolutely <laughs> completely agree yeah. just you flipping it and saying well how would you feel if somebody came up to you and then yeah. I'd be like I don't, i'd appreciate it you know that and seeing it from that perspective makes me more like okay yeah that was helpful thank you <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome the other thing i recommend is think about the relationships that you've got we've acknowledged already that some people need lots and some people don't but the analogy that I give is like plants in your garden. Uh, and lockdown was perfect for this. My wife mm. absolutely loved lockdown. She thought it was bloody great. She really, she really did. She was going to ask Boris if we could extend it at one stage. <laughs> and, and I say this semi-jokingly. The reason she liked it yeah. was because it meant that she could end the relationships that were not helpful to her, but she would she had kept on going out of duty. Mm. Mm -hmm. and and i think it's like that with relationships and sometimes you want to plant a seed like that person you say do you want to go out for a coffee because you you see something in them and you think we could be friends you, you know we could make a connection you're actually a bit different from me you could challenge me you could enrich my life i could enrich your life mm -hmm. um that's a relationship you're planting and growing you've got relationships that you that exist that you tend to because you want to keep them going and maybe they need a bit of watering and pruning and and and, and love uh, and then there are relationships that are like weeds and you need to get rid of them. Mm. So, so, And because if you get rid of toxic relationships that drain your energy and your time, then you've got more energy to spend in the good relationships, which is going in another gardening analogy. It's a bit like the tomato plant that my son's got. If you leave all the leaves on it, yeah. you soak up all the nutrition, you get tiny tomatoes. If you get rid of the, the dead stuff and the extra stuff, then you grow bigger tomatoes. So, mm. so I think it's important to think about that when it comes to relationships. Yeah, and it's putting the effort in, isn't it? And I think whether you want to cultivate more connections or just enrich the ones that you have, it's like you can't just expect them to just be that way, can you? And I think sometimes yeah. people think, myself included, you you wait for the invite rather than being the protagonist and being like, hey, I've not seen you in a while. Should we go for coffee? Or like you said about making new friends saying, hey, how about getting a coffee sometimes? It's like... Mm -hmm. We're more likely to avoid, I think, than to go after. And again, I'm not really sure why, apart from like the fear of rejection thing is the only yeah. thing that comes to my mind. It could be that. It could be because you've got a load of friends already. You don't feel you need any more, which is, which is fair enough. Yeah. Um, but I think, yes, I think there's, um, going back on our discussion earlier, it could be that that now feels more awkward, whereas maybe, you know, in the past it perhaps wouldn't have been because that was how you interacted with people anyway. There was, there was no other way of interacting with people, so you'd have a conversation with them. Mm. Whereas nowadays, you've got the choice of just WhatsApping them um, or inviting yeah. them to follow you on LinkedIn, whereas actually choosing to take that step yes. requires a bit more oomph. But it's it's generally rewarding. I'm, I'm of the opinion that very little in life that's rewarding and lasting and worthwhile comes to us easily and effortlessly. It's mm. generally associated with making a bit of an effort. Mm. Uh, you get your rewards from that mm. yeah i'm going to show you something that jane fonda said recently because i just think she's the best so she was asked what is the most rewarding benefit of having a strong group of girlfriends and i thought she had a really interesting response she said your health 
There was a study done by Harvard Medical School that said not having a group of female friends is as bad for your health as smoking. The smoking reference again. Mm -hmm. Men sit side by side looking outwards at cars, sports, at women. Women look into each other's eyes and they ask for help. They show their vulnerability. That's so important. It's so important for health. I think that's why, on average, women live five to seven years longer than men do. And I thought that was, yeah, a really interesting perspective from Jane Fonda, um, not just about friendships in general, but also that perhaps female friendships are deeper than male friendships. I think in the past, yeah, but I, th I think that's changing now, isn't it? Men have been more open talking about their feelings. and Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm quite comfortable with there being, broadly speaking, I don't want to make and get into stereotypes but i'm quite comfortable with there being a difference between the sexes because hey that's how we've always been but yeah the culture does shift over time doesn't it yeah uh, there's a lot more talk about men and mental and mental health nowadays mm -hmm. um i'm part of a group we call ourselves rather ironically the manly men we're not all that manly to be honest but we're the manly men uh, and we exist both on what's happened in real life and we're going away together this august um, and we're going to go and stay in some lodges somewhere in Oxfordshire. And then we're going to oh. do foot golf and a brewery tour. Uh, and, you know, uh, men are better, I think, at, at having sideways conversations where you don't necessarily sit down, look at you in, in the eye and say, tell me what's really going on in your life. You know, I could say uh, that to my best friend. We could do that. That would be OK. Yeah. But with a lot of blokes, that's not quite so easy. But you have the sideways conversations, don't you, where you start by chatting about whatever. and you know, before you know it, you end up talking about other things. Mm. And then the life expectancy gap is narrowing. So I wonder whether maybe is, is Jane Fonda's right? Is that a reflection of the fact that, that we aren't quite as black and white as that now and that men are getting a bit better at talking about how they're feeling? There's certainly a lot of, um, there's awareness, isn't there? There's a lot of footballers talking about mental health and men's feelings. People, ironically, people like Vinnie Jones and that kind of thing. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, Some musicians yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just I wanted to share that with you because I thought I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I thought that was a, an interesting take. And I did want to throw in a question about finding purpose in our life oh. as an antidote to to feeling oh. lonely. Yes. I mean, your book includes the word, so I felt like it was important to touch upon. Fit for purpose is the name of the book, but yeah, in terms of the importance of purpose and mm. how that correlates to loneliness and to mental health yeah. i noticed on your website you ordered um the key pillars of well-being as the following purpose mm. relationships mm -hmm. sleep eating well movement and stress management was that intentional it pretty much was you could debate where the movement and the sleeping goes but i'm, I'm firmly of the opinion gabby that if we had those first two pillars sorted in our lives. So purpose and meaning, number one, and connection with other people or relationships, number two. Mm -hmm. The rest tend to follow on by and large. And, and they're really, really important. And, and, you know, this could be a whole other, a whole other podcast episode. I know, yeah. <laughs> podcast episodes. And thank you for the shameless plug for my book. Um, <laughs> the purpose in life, I think, is, is fundamental um, because it's about what matters to you. And it takes the focus away from what's the matter with you. Uh, and it's more it's more valuable than that. Um, mm. And I think it's quite connected with connections as it were, because depending on what your values are and what the most important things are in your life, it's about how you do that is often intimately related to how you connect with other people. You know, it could be your work is really important to you. It could be your family is really important to you. It could be hobbies or pastimes or volunteering that you do is really important to you and most of those things require connecting with other with other people and of course if you share a purpose then you don't just have an individual well-being you've got an organizational well-being whether it's a surgery or a company and i talk to companies about these kind of things so i think they're both really really important and and the evidence for purpose is is really quite compelling um i, I don't want to go too much off of course here today but just as we talked about the stats for loneliness, it's been shown that having a high sense of purpose in life is associated with, and I will stress this, it's not, it have, we haven't proved cause and effect, but is strongly associated with being less likely to have a heart attack, less likely to have a stroke, 
less likely to suffer cognitive decline with things like dementia and, and brain issues, uh, better recovery from illness, including cancer, reduced rate of dying from any cause, including heart disease and cancer, certainly in women, prolonged survival in HIV, um, all kinds of really interesting things. So they're, they're, they're both really, really important pillars and they do often connect. Mm. How do you find it then if you're struggling with somebody asked me that question, what's your life purpose? And I went, uh, 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 uh. I mean, it did kind of, yeah, it, did, it just a bit kind of came out of nowhere. But yeah, I think uh, certainly again with our, our demographic of listeners, I, I do think they're struggling. And maybe it's because they think it needs to be something like quite grand and profound. Yeah. yeah. In, in a nutshell, I would say. You don't need to have one big purpose in life because that's like putting all your eggs into one basket. And if you drop the basket and break the eggs, then you're you're stuck, aren't you? Mm. So I think life, well, it's just a cliche, isn't it? But we talk about life as a journey. And the analogy that I give is you start off with a plan. You maybe you put something into your sat nav and off you go. But along the way, you might get roadworks, you might get detours, you might decide that you want to go somewhere else. So purpose can be lots of different things. Yeah. It, it can be a family related purpose. There can be a work related purpose. You might be driven for very, in various metrics of success or financial success, although that doesn't generally bring you too much happiness. And your purpose can change over time. So you don't need to have, oh my God, my purpose in life. How on earth do I even begin to address that? You could rephrase it. You could say, what matters to me in life? What really satisfies me? What brings me happiness? What can I do? that helps the people or makes the world a better place. Think about it along those lines and give yourself enough time to think about it because we often don't. I, I was doing a training course today face-to-face -to -face, and I asked people about purpose and I said, hands up who's given themselves time to think about what really matters to them in life in the last month. And I, in a group of 10 people, one hand went up. No one else had done. So it starts with giving yourself that time, whether it's you know five minutes a day, probably not enough, half an hour a week, half a day a month, whatever you can spare, just, just to really sit and be and think without all those intrusions is a good place to start. Mm. And then figure out from there what the next steps might be. It doesn't need to be, you don't need to be the Dalai Lama, you know, to sort of start down that path. <laughs> yeah, just because you did reference it. And for people that are really struggling again with loneliness, you talked about mm. um, social prescribing and a social mm. prescriber. Mm. So for those who haven't come across the term before what is a social prescriber how do we access them what do they do yes i'm very glad you asked me that question because i think i think it's a really helpful thing that a lot of people surprisingly are still not aware of certainly after i gave the talk when it was live the audience we were chatting afterwards a lot of them said i've never heard of a social prescriber before so there isn't really one neat dictionary definition but a social prescriber essentially is someone who helps other people to to figure out what does matter to them in life, what's important, and then helps them find ways of connecting to that in a meaningful way so that they can take more control over their lives mm -hmm. and as a result, benefit from better physical health, mental health and social health. And typically a social prescriber is somebody who's received some training in that, in that area. They might have had various health and psychology or community project related or charity backgrounds, perhaps. Um, they are employed all over the country and in every GP surgery or every collection of GP surgeries known as a primary care network or PCN, there will be a social prescriber because the government has paid for the NHS has paid for social prescribing roles to help partly relieve some of the stress on general practice so that people have got someone to talk to when they're lonely, who's not their GP, who is very ill-equipped to, to help them. Um, so they're all over the country. They're free. You can be referred to them. You can self-refer to them. Um, they're often, they'll have social prescribers in various voluntary organisations as well. So you don't need to necessarily go to your GP surgery to get a social prescriber's appointment. Right. And they're, they're, they're someone who's got longer to talk to you. So they might have half an hour or an hour to sit down and talk with you. Your GP's got less than 10 minutes. So it's yeah. you know, quite a contrast there. The, the analogy that my friend Tim gives, who's, a, who's an expert on social prescribing nationally and internationally, is that they're like travel agents. They don't necessarily take you on holiday, but they help you figure out where the holidays are that you want to book because right. they know about all the community resources. They know about helping you get in touch with the right people for debt management and joining clubs like 
gardening and walking and support for carers, taking up other physical activities, um, looking at housing, for example, that kind of stuff. So they're, they're people who are in the know who can help you. They don't fix you, but they help you figure out how you might, with a little bit of help, start to fix yourself. Mm. Um, and, and they're a really valuable resource. And, and I hope that all healthcare professionals listening to this, certainly GPs, if they are um, know about social prescribers because they're they're really valuable and they've been shown to reduce the likelihood of needing a GP appointment by twenty eight percent, and the like. Get this: the likelihood of attending A and E by twenty four percent. Goodness, twenty four percent. Well, yeah. that's quite telling, isn't it? Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry we've run over, so I'm going to get into our. Happier Life Projects, last five and five, because I can't let you go. Okay. This is, how, this is our signature sign off. This Richard. is what you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. When and where are you at your happiest? I am at my happiest when I am usually out and about, so not stuck indoors, with my friends and family, or the other extreme, locked away in a very small, quiet space doing some nerdy research. Those are my two happiest places what's your favorite thing to do that nourishes your mental health so two things riding on a sunday morning with my best mate al we go for a mountain bike ride and then we go for a breakfast and we pray together and that's that's one of the best parts of my week and the other bit is um by myself running and um listening to podcasts i'm an insatiable podcast listener so very much love being listening to and being privileged to be a guest on other people's podcasts <laughs> oh what piece of advice do you now know that you wished somebody would have told you earlier that would have made you a happier person? This is probably the one that I thought the longest about. Um, so <laughs> I would say, and this perhaps relates a little bit back to the loneliness and reaching out to people, mm. you are just as good as anyone else. Imposter syndrome is entirely normal. I've had it all my life and I've just taken the fake it till you make it approach. Um, and everybody else is making it up as they go along as well. So just get stuck in and don't feel inferior. Mm. What is the most important one thing that needs to change to make the world a happier place? And I think this touches on something we've already spoken about, Gabby, which is the fact that we are all, all interconnected and that true well-being comes from interdependence and community. Mm. And we'll never be happy as, as individually or as a society if it's all about what can I do to optimise my well-being. It's quite a selfish and privileged approach to life to do that. Mm. And I think the more we think about community, the, the better that a place the world becomes. Mm. And finally, what is a simple, actionable first step we can take when it comes to feeling or becoming less lonely that will help us on our mission to building a happier life? So going back to my comments about thriving in tribes, build your tribe one person at a time. I love that. So for people to find out more about you and to, I guess, be signposted how they can purchase the book, is the best place to go your website, feelgoodforlife.uk? Yeah, that's got lots of information on there. Um, I'm on all the usual socials, including um, Twitter, although I try to use that less than I did because it's better for your mental health. A bit on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, my book, Fit for Purpose, is uh, published by HarperCollins, and you can get that in you know the, all the usual formats, including, if you're really lucky, audio book with me reading it. So there you go. That would be a, mm. an extra bonus. But yeah, my, my website's got most of the information on it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is going to be such a, a valuable episode for so many people listening. Thank yeah. you, Gabby. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you again to Dr. Richard Pyle. And thank you to you for listening to this very episode of the Happier Life Project with me, Gabby Sanderson. And if you can, just stick with me for one more minute of your time while I share the important housekeeping. If you are suffering with your mental health, there is a crisis button on the My Possible Self app, which will signpost you to the correct information for immediate expert advice. Those of you who are listening on one of the podcast platforms, the My Possible Self app is completely free to download, so you don't need to worry about it costing you anything. 
If you are in crisis or you think you may have an emergency, please do call your doctor or the emergency services immediately. The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the interviewer, which is me, and the interviewees. The content of this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a substitute for professional or medical advice. Our partners at the Priory Healthcare are not involved in the production or content of this podcast. If you found this episode helpful, then please do share it with as many people as you think would benefit from it. And to find and follow us on social media, we are at My Possible Self and I've been at Radio Gabby. Do take care and I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.